welcome everybody. Thank you um, so much for joining the POTS and Pregnancy webinar. Um, I'm Jo Bullingham, I'm the Charity Secretary for POTS UK, and I'm delighted to in um, introduce Dr. Daniel Belace. Um, he is the Consultant Obstetrician and Gynaecologist at the University Maternity Hospital in Limerick. Um, so it's absolutely great to see you. Thank you very much for giving up your time to do this today. Not at all. No, not at all. Thank you. Um, apologies that it looks like I'm sat in the dark. I've just been explaining to um, uh, Dr. Belace that when I turn my camera off and then back on, it does this weird thing. So apologies, everyone. I am in a very light room, but never mind. We will uh, we will crack on. Um, so it is our kind of formal um, standard layout that we'll go with today. Um, we will have a presentation lasting about 20 to 30 minutes. And then there'll be plenty of time at the end for questions. Um, if you can pop those into the Q&A box rather than the chat, and then it kind of keeps it all in order. Um, and I will be able to go through those at the end. Um, if there's any sort of tech issues or you can't hear or anything like that, then just pop it into the chat box and I'll be monitoring that throughout. Um, at the end of the session, as your Zoom link closes, um, a survey will pop up. Um, if people are happy to complete that, it would be a really big help to us. And it's always nice to get feedback on the session and see what went well and what you'd like us to improve on and any other ideas for future sessions. Um, as ever, it will be added to our YouTube channel. So if you can't stay for the whole session or if there's anything you want to listen back to, um, then it will be added to our YouTube channel in a couple of days um, and we'll add uh, notices to all of our social media um, so that you're aware when it sits up on there. Um, I think that's everything from me. Um, so I will hand over now to Dr. Belace. Um, thank you so much again for giving up your time. I've Lovely. had a quick look at the slides and it looks like it's going to be a really fascinating talk. So thank you very thank much. You. Thank you. And can I just make sure that um, I'm sharing my screen? I just, because I normally do this over WebEx and Teams. I just want to make sure. Yeah, that, absolutely. Um, I just do this here. So share screen and how's that? Is that that's, up okay? that's perfect. Just need to make it. That's it. Brilliant. Okay. Thank you. Well, thank you very much for joining and thank you to Joe and to the POTS team for asking me to come and join today uh, to give this first, I believe, uh, talk for the POTS team um, on pregnancy and POTS. Um, as Joe mentioned, my name is Dan Borlase. Uh, I'm a consultant obstetrician and gynaecologist in Limerick in Ireland. And I have a particular interest in looking after women either with pre existing medical problems or looking after women who have pregnancy um, medical problems arising um, as a result of their pregnancy. So what I thought I'd do today is just give an overview of, of pregnancy and POTS. Um, I'm not going to dwell too much on what POTS is because I appreciate that I'm talking to a, a number of POTS sufferers or, or, or those who know someone very close to them with POTS. Um, so I won't go into too much detail on what POTS is. It's more for uh, if any of my colleagues are joining um, who are unsure about POTS. I might, I'm going to go through a little bit about what, um, how um, pregnancy itself might affect POTS and how POTS itself as a condition might affect pregnancy. Um, and most importantly, talking about um, how to plan for pregnancy in someone with POTS. And one of the things that I'm always asked about uh, when seeing women either in pregnancy or before pregnancy is about talking about medications that are sometimes used in POTS. So we'll go through those. Um, above all, the most important thing I want to do today is to reassure you that um, pregnancy is safe in POTS and with only a very min minority of people who, who report an exacerbation of symptoms, um, there is, it's very, very unusual for there to be anything um, that complicates pregnancy as a result of POTS alone. So uh, what is POTS? Um, so as you are all aware, it's what we call a, a dysautonomia. Um, we have two nervous systems, a voluntary nervous system, which allows us to flex our muscles, get up and walk, and an involuntary nervous system called the autonomic nervous system, um, which allows us allows the body to change things like heart rate and blood pressure and controls our gut. And it's these subtle changes in that autonomic system um, that, that stops you from, from causing orthostatic intolerance with changes in posture. And it's entirely relevant that we're having this conversation because um, POTS affects women five times more than it does men. And of those women, it is more likely to occur in women of childbearing age. So it's really important 
for why we're having this conversation today. The other thing that I always say to people about POTS, particularly my colleagues, is that actually it's in comparison to a lot of the ailments and conditions that we see and treat as doctors, it's only first really described since 1993. And so um, it's fairly recent really in, in terms of all the other conditions that we, that we manage. And for that reason, it is often misunderstood. Um, it's misdiagnosed, it's underrepresented and underdiagnosed. And that's why I also feel that it's important that you are empowered to educate us as doctors as well about this condition. And specifically for obstetricians um, who, are, who are the doctors that look after people in pregnancy, because it might have been many years since they saw um, um, or, or managed any medical problems in pregnancy and may not themselves have even heard of the condition. Um, and I can certainly vouch for that in that um, um, when I was at medical school, um, uh, POTS never even featured on our curriculum. So it's important that you're aware that not all doctors um, are aware of the condition, particularly pregnancy doctors. So that's all I'm going to say about what POTS is, because I think you'll know more than I do, in fact, about what it is. But how does POTS or how might POTS affect pregnancy? Well, you may be aware that there are a vast number of hemodynamic changes that happen in pregnancy. I'm not going to get too technical about it, but owing to all the hormone effects of pregnancy, with progesterone being the most abundant hormone in pregnancy, our blood vessels become a lot wider and dilated. And together with the development of the placenta, um, that um, makes us have a lower, what we call systemic vascular resistance. And to compensate in a way for that, our plasma volume or the amount of fluid in our body essentially increases by 50%. And that's certainly by the second to third parts of pregnancy, um, that it increases vast amount of more fluid is, 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 in, is, in, is in the body. Um, and so despite that, and despite the fact that the heart rate sometimes goes up as well, and our heart is working 40% more than it is in pregnancy than it is out of pregnancy, 60 to 70% of women either report very stable symptoms in pregnancy or actually an improvement in their symptoms as well for reasons that we don't fully understand. There are, however, a minority of patients that will, however, um, have worsening symptoms. And when that happens, it tends to either be in the first or the second trimesters of pregnancy, um, and particularly in women who might have the extreme form of nausea and vomiting in pregnancy called hypremesis gravidarum, where um, a condition where there is excessive nausea and vomiting in pregnancy, um, and that can cause dehydration and might make people with POTS um, uh, um, have an exacerbation of their symptoms. There was a study done in 2013 which looked at, well, which women are more likely to get exacerbations in pregnancy compared to the others. And it was found that women who didn't require medical treatment prior to pregnancy were less likely to report an increase in the severity of their symptoms during pregnancy. And it might well be that that's because they have um, a, a less um, extreme form of the condition. Whereas those who were requiring medicines prior to, um, to, to, to embarking on a pregnancy were more likely to develop um, um, uh, worsening of symptoms during the pregnancy. And that was particularly found during the second trimester. Um, and there's a couple of reasons for this. Um, and it might well be that it's the dilutional effects of the medicines that they're taking to try and control their symptoms. As I mentioned before in a previous slide, that the, the amount of fluid in the body essentially increases by 50%. And so it's a little bit like diluting squash. And this isn't just relevant to POTS, but it, it's the same with all sort of medicines in pregnancy in that um, if, you, if, you, if you have more water, but the same amount of squash, it's more dilute. And it might be that, that, that it's the dilutional effects and the medicines that are controlling their symptoms, which might be a reason for the exacerbation. Um, but it is unusual though, um, and I've certainly not seen um, any women having to have second or third agents adding to their regime um, for, for medicines going through the pregnancy. Um, and it's important to note as well that not all mums-to-be will experience the same symptoms. So just in the same way as pregnancy, um, with or without POTS, um, pregnancy um, is a very individual uh, condition and not all women will have the same symptoms. And it's the same with women with pregnancy and POTS together. 
In terms of how POTS might affect pregnancy, um, well, I want to, as I said before, provide real reassurance that actually there is no evidence at all that POTS alone causes any adverse pregnancy outcomes. Um, and I say alone because there are a number of conditions which are associated with um, POTS that, um, that, that, that potentially do have more of an impact in pregnancies we'll come on to a little bit later. But preterm birth, for example, the rates are not increased in women with POTS, miscarriage and stillbirth, um, the rates are the same as the general population. Parity is a word we use as, as obstetricians and midwives um, to describe the number of um, of, of, of pregnancies or children that you've had. And there was previously some query as to whether or not having more children uh, previously increases the risks, but actually that's been disproven. There's no evidence that um, the more children you have or the less number of children you have any effects of POTS. Um, and mode of birth. Um, vaginal delivery is, vaginal birth is safe in uh, POTS as is all forms of um, delivery in cesarean sections as well as we'll come on to, um, but it's important that you know that, that vaginal birth is safe in POTS. If I said to someone with POTS, what are your symptoms? Um, and I frequently ask this actually when people come at the very beginning of their pregnancy and I say to them, well, tell me what, so give me 10 symptoms that, that, that POTS sufferers have and, and they will report dizziness and syncope, which is blackouts, shortness of breath, sweating, palpitations or the awareness of the heartbeat, chest pain, fatigue, brain fog and mind fuzziness and, and gut disturbance such as diarrhea and constipation. Now, if I asked um, a woman after her pregnancy what her symptoms of pregnancy were, you'll see that a lot of those symptoms are very similar to some women. And it's important that I mention this because I wouldn't want anyone to feel that because they have POTS and have those symptoms, that just because they have those symptoms that they're gonna be in any way exacerbated because of the pregnancy, because they already have those symptoms, therefore they're going to get worse. And as I've mentioned before, that 60 to 70% of women actually have a much have, have a, a much improvement in their symptoms, bar chest pain. Chest pain in pregnancy isn't uh, normal and that should always be investigated. And that's not to say that things like shortness of breath aren't, um, are, you know, are, are completely benign. There are reasons why certain conditions um, certain symptoms are more worrying and they do would, would need to be investigated but I don't want you to think that that because you have POTS and have those symptoms that they're going to be exacerbated in pregnancy and the other reason why I put this on there as well is that therefore it can be very it's a difficult um, condition to di diagnose at the best of times as I'm sure many people are aware um, but it's something that's particularly difficult to diagnose in pregnancy because of the symptoms and, and, and people might not think about it. As with any condition, any medical problem, um, it's very important that you seek help before you embark on a pregnancy um, um, so that we are able to support you in that. And that might be your primary care physician or your GP. It might be your cardiologist or neurocardiologist that you see for your POTS, or it might even be an obstetrician or an obstetric physician um, who is able to go through those with you. And um, so that we can give you a plan for pregnancy and what you may or may not expect. Um, it's important that you have a baseline assessment of what your POTS symptoms are now so that we can make, make sure that we are able to identify any changes that happen to the pregnancy, during the pregnancy. Um, and as part of the planning for the pregnancy, one of the most important reasons for that is it's an opportunity to discuss, to optimize and to rationalize any of the medications that you may also um, be taking already for POTS because they may or may not have an impact um, to, to the developing baby. Um, and it's also an opportunity to identify any associated or coexistent conditions. And many people may be aware that POTS is associated with conditions such as Ehlers-Danlos syndrome and other hypermobility conditions um, and mast cell activation syndrome as well. Um, and, and, and particularly with Ehlers-Danlos syndrome, there are certain forms or certain uh, forms of Ehlers-Danlos syndrome which can be much more dangerous in pregnancy. But that's why I was mentioning before that as POTS alone as a condition um, doesn't have any significant impact in pregnancy. Um, folic acid, very important, um, and I'm sure people are aware that they'd need to take that on the three months prior to the pregnancy and, and for the, certainly for the three months for the first 12 weeks of the pregnancy. Vitamin D um, is something that I prescribe all my women um, during pregnancy, um, and, and that's for a number of reasons, really. Certainly the last 18 months 
have been very difficult for all of us. We've not really been outside and seeing much sunshine. So our bone health is particularly important anyway. Um, but also in POTS, particularly for those who've got a more severe form of POTS where mobility is an issue, they might not have the, the bone health um, uh, that, that, that they would need and to, to sustain them through the pregnancy and after, and breastfeeding after in particular. So the other reason why um, planning for the pregnancy is really important is, um, is so that we can make sure that you're awake. It's, it's a very anxious time deciding to, 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 to have a pregnancy. And so it's important that particularly with POTS where symptoms can be very scary, that you, you understand what your schedule of care um, might be like during pregnancy and, and how, how the pregnancy will go. And that might allay some of the anxieties um, surrounds um, before starting a pregnancy. As I mentioned before, not all mums will experience the same symptoms and therefore it's really important then that all pregnancy care is individualised and tailored to the symptoms that women are having. Um, and if you've got very um, minor symptoms of your POTS, then it may well be you don't need to see an obstetrician during the pregnancy. Um, certainly they might refer you um, for, for an initial, initial assess assessment by an obstetrician at the beginning of pregnancy. But if you don't have severe symptoms, then it can be that you can be under completely low risk and, 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 and sorry, normal risk, I should say, um, midwifery led care. Um, you can have an early referral um, to the maternity team for that reason so that you can discuss the schedule of care. Be mindful that, as I mentioned before, that um, a disproportionate number of women with POTS do suffer from the extremer form of nausea and vomiting in pregnancy. And it's not known whether that's a cause or effect of the pregnancy or POTS itself, but just be mindful of that, particularly because with people with severe nausea and vomiting, they are less, they're, they're dehydrated essentially, and they have less fluid in their body. And so it might be that their symptoms are more exacerbated. So be mindful of that. Make sure that at the beginning of the pregnancy, you have a baseline system as assessment of how you are um, um, in, at the beginning of pregnancy and that they're assessed also um, at each visit that you have with an obstetrician. You may be referred to an anaesthetist. Um, it's not essential that you're referred to an anaesthetist, but particularly in women with more severe forms of the condition, it's important that they're seen by um, an anaesthetist mainly to talk about what the options are for analgesia. And that usually happens at the third trimester, sometime after 28 weeks. So you may well be told that you need an anaesthetic assessment, but um, it's not compulsory and um, particularly if you don't have severe symptoms and it wouldn't usually be expected that you'd see them until much later on in the pregnancy. In terms of scans, if you have a low risk pregnancy, other than the anomaly scan, there is no evidence to suggest that you need to have serial growth scans for this condition. And there is no evidence to suggest that there is an increased risk of fetal growth restriction. And as, as mentioned before, stillbirth and miscarriage and things, they're, they're the same as the, the, the general background, uh, the general population. And the slight caveat to that is that if you're on very high dose beta blockers, there is some evidence that suggests that high dose beta blockers can reduce um, birth weight, but not to a significant um, level that would be worrying. And as I mentioned before, it's really important that we make sure that we're um, mindful of the medications you're taking um, at each visit as well during the pregnancy. In terms of conservative management, so the conservative management that you will all be using, I would imagine, prior to um, having uh, medicine for this condition are not affected by pregnancy. Aerobic exercise is, um, is, is important to keep us all healthy. Elasticated compression stockings are important too, and, and perhaps more so in pregnancy because, as I mentioned before, there's more fluid, and certainly towards the end of pregnancy, there is more pooling of fluid, particularly in the legs and the extremities. And so um, compression stockings might allow for that fluid to be pushed back up into this into this and central um, circulation so that that reduces your symptoms of POTS if they're getting worse. Caffeine is usually avoided in pregnancy anyway. Um, um, in, in to, well, in certain doses is okay, but, uh, but on the whole it's avoided in pregnancy. Um, but caffeine is a, is a diuretic essentially, and so that might also deplete fluid volumes and therefore um, avoiding caffeine if your symptoms are worse is important. 
Um, most people will be aware that um, salt intake of six grams may help symptoms of POTS and we would sometimes say that that can be increased to 10 grams um, in pregnancy uh, to try and keep fluid in the body and to make sure that you're aware of, of, of yourself in terms of um, how much you're peeing, how much you're drinking um, and, and increasing fluid intake if your symptoms are, get, are getting worse. The, the only caution with that obviously is uh, with, with something called a pregnancy specific condition called preeclampsia, um, which is high blood pressure associated with pregnancy. Um, and in that condition, we want we don't want you to be um, too full of fluid. We actually want you more than anything to be to less full of fluid. And so that's the only time where we would need to be really mindful of how much fluid you are taking. There's a little diagram there, um, which is a pregnancy woman lying on a back and a pregnant woman lying on her left side. Um, and the, the, the line, if you just focus the top there, um, that is the woman lying on her back and the red line is sort of a cut through and you can see that the gravid uterus, um, the, if you're lying on your back, the baby um, and the, 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 the pregnancy is lying on the major vessels which bring blood flow back from the lower extremities into the body. Um, and it is alleviated by laying on the left side. You can see actually on the one down below that the, the vena cava um, and the aorta are, are, are less likely to comp be compressed when you're lying on your side. And that's general information that we give to, to all women in pregnancy, whether or not you have POTS, but perhaps you're more likely to experience those symptoms or um, with, with POTS. And so um, consider um, your positioning, particularly with sleeping. Now, medication. Medication I'm always asked about, and I'm going to go through this, and there may be questions towards the end. So if you have got specific questions, then do ask them. But as with all conditions in medicine, um, say, for example, um, blood pressure, for example, there are many, many different medicines we use, and they all work in different ways. And there are many different types of medicines and classes of medicines that we use to support them with POTS. And because they will work in different ways, they'll all therefore have different ways that they might affect a pregnancy. And for the vast majority of them, we have lots of evidence to suggest that they are probably safe in pregnancy. And we also have to look after the mum. And so particularly your quality of life during the pregnancy. So if your symptoms are very severe and you need medicine, then, we, then you need medicine. You know, you can't go through the nine months of your pregnancy uh, not enjoying it and having very severe symptoms of POTS if, 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 you, um, if you're having a severity in symptoms. So to do, don't think that just because you're pregnant, you shouldn't take these medicines. And, and I'm going to come on to in the next slide um, which medicines are more safe than others. While the aim is probably no medicine at all, if, 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 you can, if you can avoid it, if you do require medicines, then as with all things in pregnancy, the single drug, one drug is better than two or three, and at the lowest and most effective dose is the best thing to do. So if you need something, have it, but have it at the lowest dose that causes an, an alleviation of your symptoms. So this is a slightly bigger, busy slide. Um, you'll see in the second column there, these are all the common drugs that you would probably be use, uh, probably uh, be having in, in with, with your condition. Um, I like to, because I'm quite simple, I like to uh, simplify them um, as to being the rate controllers. So the rate controllers are the ones that sort of settle the heart rate down. And so beta blockers are the most common form of those. The volume expanders, the ones that increase the amount of fluid in your body. And the vasoconstrictors are the ones which help tighten the blood vessels and keep the blood flow into the vessels and help um, alleviate symptoms of POTS. Now you can see here, um, I'm going to go through them all individually. Um, propanolol and nabetalol are both forms of blood, um, beta blockers. So betalol is actually a beta and alpha blocker. Um, but propanolol is by far, by and large, certainly with women that I see, are the ones that are mo most likely to be um, beyond prior to pregnancy. And there's lots of evidence to suggest that they are safe in pregnancy. Nabetalol we use in pregnancy anyway um, for conditions such as preeclampsia, as I mentioned before, to control blood pressure. And so that is also safe. In fact, labetalol is one of the only medicines that we know is safe in pregnancy and we're actually licensed to be able to use in pregnancy. Bisoprolol is most likely to be safe. And I say most likely to be safe is, is because it's, it's one of those ones that in higher doses, there is evidence that it does reduce birth weight. And, and that's why I've said that it's probably safe, even though, even though it, is, um, it is probably safe there's other ones that would be used preferentially, such as propranolol rather than, rather than bisoprolol. But I see many women in pregnancy with other cardiac conditions on bisoprolol, 
um, with no problems at all. If Aberdeen is, is not a beta blocker, it's, um, it specifically affects the sinonatrial node, and there is some um, evidence, particularly in animal studies, that this is actually dangerous and what we call teratogenetic, so it, it, it actually causes malformations in babies. And so I wouldn't have that in pregnancy, and I would try and avoid it as much as possible in anybody who is of childbearing age for that reason. Uh, you know, sometimes we can do all we can to prevent pregnancies, but that isn't always the case. And so that's something I would probably avoid in childbearing age, if at all possible. Um, fludrocortisone and desmopressin. So um, these are two medicines work very differently, um, but are medicines which actually we know are safe in pregnancy because um, women who have a certain number of conditions require them to survive. Um, so, for example, there's a condition called Addison's disease, um, which um, um, so we use fludrocortisone for that and, and they need that for, for survival. Um, and, and so obviously women with Addison's disease do get pregnant and so they have to have that medicine and there is no reported problems with using it. Same with desmopressin or DDAVP. We use that for a condition called diabetes insipidus or um, a bleeding condition called von Willebrand's. And again, they are, women require that in, in, in their lives. And so um, that's including in pregnancy as well. Midodrin is one of these vasoconstrictors. There's, there's insufficient data to say whether or not it is safe or not. So I prefer to use it, not use it. Um, and certainly if they come up at the beginning of pregnancy, I try and wean them off and, and suggest that they see their cardiologists to see if there's any other alternative medicines they could use. Somatostatin, again, probably safe. Pridostigmine is a different kind of medicine. So these are different class of medicines we use in something called Myasthenia gravis. And again, um, women are dependent on that medicine and that's safe. And clonidine as well. So in terms of birth, um, it's important to, so that you're reassured that POTS doesn't influence mode of birth. So vaginal birth is not a contraindication, uh, sorry, vaginal birth is not a contraindication in someone with POTS, but also I want to reassure you that some women do need to have a cesarean section and that is also safe too. Um, when you are in labour, it is normal for there to be heart fluctuations in, in labour anyway, in anybody, whether you have POTS or not. But I do ask women with POTS, um, and I do ask our midwives and our obstetricians who are looking after women with POTS, just to be mindful of what the heart rates are doing during labour. Um, and heart rates are almost always monitored during labour as part of routine care anyway. Fluid balance is particularly important, as you will be aware. So I make sure that when you're in labour, that we're monitoring how much fluid you're drinking and how much fluid we're giving you and how much fluid you're, you're, you're peeing and all the other insensible losses that happen during labour, such as sweating and things, to avoid dehydration. Analgesia, epidurals are effective and they are safe. Um, and there is no contraindication to using those when you have POTS with birth either. There are many medicines we use um, sometimes during labour, oxytocin, um, ergometrin, um, all the other, all these other medicines um, can be used as they are, um, as we normally use them. The only thing I would say is that oxytocin should, uh, should be given slowly because it has sometimes a, a, an ability to cause a rebound tachycardia if given too quickly, but we would only give oxytocin slowly um, really in, in labour anyway. Um, and there is no um, indication to routinely shorten the second stage of labour. So once you are fully dilated, um, there are certain cardiac conditions or certain medical conditions where we would want to reduce the, the, the shorten the second stage of you pushing because it causes increased Valsalva and increased um, symptoms of certain cardiac conditions, but it's not necessary in POTS. It's safe for you to push, um, providing that um, that you feel comfortable in doing so. And if there are struggles, if there are problems and there are concerns, then we can um, assist you with, um, with the birth thereafter. Postnatal care. So some women um, will experience an exacerbation immediately following birth. And you remember that I said that um, there is an increase in fluid volume by up to 50%. Um, in pregnancy. And so most women may have three and a half to four litres of fluid in a non-pregnant woman, but that can be increased up to six and a half, seven litres. And so that fluid um, goes somewhere immediately after birth and 
obviously a small amount will be lost as blood. And there is a massive diuresis in all pregnancy, in all, um, once everyone's delivered there, that you'll notice you'll pee a lot more. But then all the fluid and all that fluid that's been, and the blood that's been surrounding the baby in the pregnancy will have to go back into the central circulation immediately after baby's born. So it's not uncommon for women with POPs in particular to, to report an exacerbation immediately following birth. But that's usually very, very um, short sustained and not long lasting. Early mobilization is really key. Um, and that's why um, I was mentioning actually about the uh, mode of birth. Um, I find that um, with women with POTS that they actually report worsening symptoms if they have had a cesarean, not for any of, not the, the direct result of the cesarean causing a problem with POTS, but because they are a little less mobile immediately after delivery. Um, and so they are lying in bed for, for a bit longer than what they would do perhaps if they had a normal delivery. So, so I have noticed that. And so um, early mobilization and being out of bed um, as soon as possible is really important. Compression stockings, as I mentioned before, notice your diuresis. So notice how much you're peeing. As I mentioned that um, peeing more is more common after babies are born and just making sure that those, um, that those fluids are replaced and avoiding dehydration. And the other thing is that if you are experiencing prolonged exacerbations of symptoms, then, then make sure you've got the right support at home, partner, mother, um, and all that family support network, and particularly when you're nursing babies as well, if you're feeling unsteady, that's really, really important. So um, hopefully I've provided a bit of a summary and I know that there'll be many questions and that's why I've sort of made this, the slides themselves um, short. Um, but the sum summary essentially is that I want to reassure you that, that the pregnancy is safe with POTS. Most women uh, remain stable um, and have an improvement in their symptoms. There is no adverse pregnancy outcomes associated with POTS alone. It, I want to emphasize the importance of pre-pregnancy planning, particularly in POTS, but also in all medical problems. Um, and just, just be mindful of those medicines um, here. And I'm sure you'll be able to get a copy of the slides afterwards if you want to refresh. So yeah, providing a little reassurance there that POTS is safe in pregnancy. Um, I did want to talk about what we have all been talking about over the last 18 months. And I know that this isn't potentially the right platform um, for it, but I just wanted to talk about COVID-19 and pregnancy. And I know it's not directly related to POTS, but um, we're now seeing a lot more women being affected by COVID-19 uh, than we did in the first and second waves. Perhaps this is due to the Delta variant. Um, and it's important that you you, you do consider at least um, taking up on the vaccine, although I'm, I'm, I'm pleased to report that a number of women that I'm seeing who I'm booking now at the beginning of pregnancy have already been vaccinated. But there is more evidence now to suggest that having um, COVID in, in pregnancy is much more dangerous um, than the vaccine. In the vaccine, there is no evidence that there is any uh, problems with taking it. And you can use these QR codes to look at information either directly from the government websites and the bottom QR code there is all the most up-to-date information from our Royal College of Obstetricians and Gynecologists if you feel that you need that. Further reading then, um, there is a very, um, very good book um, called Postural Tachycardia Syndrome. Um, <clears throat> and I've um, supported, I've helped write, uh, write a, a chapter along with uh, the amazing Professor Kel Catherine nelson Piercy, um, who is at Guy's in St. Thomas's where I trained. Um, and we've written a, a chapter in that book. There is also um, a very good uh, article, which is mainly geared for, um, for, for healthcare professionals on postural tachycardia syndrome in pregnancy. And I think there's a link to that actually on the POPS website. And of course, uh, further reading, there is a very, very useful and helpful section of um, managing POPS in pregnancy um, on, on the main POPS UK website as well. Uh, these are my references um, and uh, time for questions and I guess um, I'll hand back over to Joe in a moment but just to say that if there are questions and there are any questions that um, you don't immediately think of or perhaps if there are any questions that you don't want to ask the bigger floor and you'd ask you want to ask more sort of personal questions or sensitive questions I'm more than happy for those to be passed on to Joe and I'll help wherever I can. Just thank you so much I think 
it's a really, like you say, it has, it is a difficult one to organise, but I think it will be um, great for people just to have somebody talking about pregnancy in pots, really, and just giving some advice. And like you say, it's very individual, but I'm sure it's been a, a great kind of a great starting point for lots of people um, and lots of things that they can go to their um, consultants and doctors and everybody with and kind of have a bit of information. So thank you yeah. so much. You're welcome. Um, just a couple of other general things unrelated to this. Um, I just want to let people know that we've got our POTS retreat coming up on the 24th of October. Um, there's lots of um, kind of updates about it on social media. I'll include the link to it again in the email. It's um, taking part, uh, taking place in the Cotswolds, and it's also we're also doing it on um, a kind of a virtual patient day as well. So if you can't attend in person and you wanted to zoom into the sessions, then you'd be very welcome to do so. The tickets are available, um, and I'll send the details through with that on the email. And then the other thing is we're currently in the process of setting up um, online peer support groups via Zoom. Um, we're just running a pilot at the moment. Um, as people may have seen on um, social media, we've been talking about um, our plans. Um, I think what would be lovely kind of further down the line once the pilot's successful is to set up maybe a pregnancy and pots or, a, um, you know, something so that people can get together in this situation, because it can be quite a lonely time, I would imagine. Um, and uh, it would be nice to be able to connect people um, with one another. So that's something to kind of look out for in the future. And we'll keep you posted with more information. But um, that's everything then for me. I will, um, once the meeting's finished, if you can do the survey, that would be great. But um, I just want to say thank you very much again um, for giving up your time and your evening to do, the, uh, to do this. Cool. And uh, we'll, we'll no doubt be in touch with queries. <laughs> okay, that's great. Thank you so much, Joe. Okay, I'm going to head up now. Thank you very much. Thank you. Take care. Bye-bye. Thanks, everyone. Bye.